Well, this is the slot before lunch, so we'll be crisp and, uh, and chewy to give you an anticipation. Um, General um, Sir Richard, uh, you too are a civilian now, um, you are well known, if not notorious, in Poland and beyond as the author of a book uh, published earlier this year in the UK and actually coming out in, 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 in Poland this, this week in Polish um, on war with Russia in 2017. This book was written last year. What is your assessment today of the risk? And you are known to be saying the book is not a prediction, it's not a, a blueprint for a particular set of events, but a warning building on what was said by General Breedlove or Mr. Breedlove uh, regarding regarding preparedness in the in the in the NATO in the NATO community. So what is your assessment today of the threat? And I'm mindful of a number of facts which we're all aware of, that the, the level of hysteria coming out of Moscow is 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 higher than ever. Russia has been accused of war crimes in Syria. Donbass continues to smolder. Iskanders once again have been deployed in Kaliningrad. I've lost count of the number of times that's happened. And uh, uh, of course, um, uh, we have 40 million Russians involved in civil, in civil defense exercises. Uh, so what is, your, what is your assessment? And again, given that we're looking at a three or six month interregnum in the States, whoever gets in before a new administration gets its feet collectively under the table. Well, I think the sense I get is of a steady ratcheting up of tension and pressure. Uh, we've seen the announcement of the formation of three motor rifle divisions earlier this year. I think in January the announcement was made in Western Military District on the, the frontiers of the, the Baltic states. We've continued to see uh, regular incursions by into airspace, uh, into NATO airspace. Um, and then on top of that, of course, we've, we've seen snap exercises, indeed a recent snap exercise using the scenario of the invasion and occupation of, of the Baltic states. And all that, I think, sends a very, a very dangerous signal of planning that now, of course, there's a difference between pl planning and, and intent. But I think we need to take note of all that together, of course, with, as you rightly say, the the increased tension and pressures over, over the, civil, the, civil, the civil war in, in Syria. Uh, and all of this, I think, creates a climate of, of, of real um, uncertainty. And it highlights absolutely the importance, as General Breedlove has just been saying, of, of alliance solidarity. That strength, that source of strength for the NATO alliance remains its, its alliance cohesion. Um, but also, I would highlight the the absolute imperative of, of effective and credible deterrence. Uh, and I think, if I may say so, I think we're still a long way short of that. There are some clearly some good signs, and the, the Warsaw Summit earlier this year made absolutely the, the, a good start in this respect, um, with the announcement that there will be four battalions forward-based in the three Baltic states in eastern Poland, uh, but I note it's October, um, and there's some, it's, it's, it's some time since that, 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 that announcement was made. Uh, indications are that that will begin to happen next year. There have uh, just been some noises but, to that but, but nevertheless, it is all about following through. And so I think, um, I think we need to take note of that. Now, we don't need, to, I mean, we, we mustn't get in any way hysterical about it, but we just need to look at the, 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 the threat, look at the challenges in a cold and sober way, and take the necessary action. And the way that NATO will continue to keep the peace in Western Europe is the way NATO kept the peace during the, the, the years of the Cold War through effective and credible deterrence, both conventional and nuclear. Now, part of that, and this is picking up another of the points you made in your opening statement, uh, remains, of course, the, um, the, the, the importance of the, the election in, in America. And I think, speaking firmly as a, as a European here, um, there can be little doubt, I think, that the security and defense of Europe since NATO was formed in 1949 has depended on the total certainty that 
whatever president occupies the White House, there will be no questions, no ifs, no buts about America's willingness and readiness to come to the aid of a NATO member if attacked, thus underpinning Article 5 and collective defense. Um, and we can but hope that, the, that that certainty will continue whoever gets elected in, uh, in November. Before we uh, return to collective behavior in, in NATO, could I draw you on where you think the weak points might be, where the points, the flash points might be if the man in the Kremlin decides that he, uh, that he needs some more activity? The Baltics, which you've, you, you, you've dwelt on quite a lot, Poland itself, Donbass, Syria, even Belarus, there are voices in Moscow saying this is a good time to quotes, reclaim uh, Belarus. Uh, any or all of them or a number of them? Can I draw you on, on, on the real potential flashpoints? Well, I'm not a, a crystal ball gazer, although I've made an effort in to, 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 to outline a scenario which, which could be, I hope it's not, but it's, it, it, there's, a, there's a plausibility about it, I think. Um, I, I think, firstly, the Baltic states. I think a, a spotlight shines on the Baltics on the Baltic region, and particularly the Baltic states, in almost uh, the same way that a spotlight shone on Berlin during the years of the Cold War, um, partly because they are former Soviet republics, partly because of what Mr. Putin has said about it is the desire of the Russian people, 95% of the Russian people, he said, believe it is the, the duty of Russia to look after the interests of all Russians, even if some states don't like that. And of course, there are significant Russian-speaking uh, minorities, in particular Latvia and Lithuania. Um, and I think also, any suggestions, uh, here is the man, of course, who's also called, uh, suggest, said that, uh, called for a new Yalta being the most appropriate security settlement for Europe, implying that the way Russia achieves its security is through domination of its near abroad, which would, of course, impact significantly, particularly on the Baltic states. But I don't, of course, uh, Poland would come into that, that category as well. Um, so there is, a, there is, the, there is the, the concern. But the flashpoint could come anywhere. Uh, I think what we're seeing in Syria is exceptionally dangerous, potentially, as well. Um, as uh, that appears now to be increasingly a confrontation uh, between not only, I mean, it's a, is it a proxy war involving pretty well e most regional powers in, in, in the Middle East, but it has the potential also to become a proxy, a proxy conflict for, for, to settle uh, differences between the West and, and Russia, and that I think we've got to be very careful you, about. You've made the point elsewhere that um, we, we should remember that Moscow sees the world holistically. We tend to see it in terms of regional behaviors, regional structures inevitably uh, regional silos in the foreign ministries or in the state departments of the world. Uh, is this something you want to expand on? Well, I think, I think what it highlights is that, that I, I think Russia thinks strategically. Um, and of course, Russia is, a, is not just a European power, it's a, it's a Central Asian power, and it's a, it's, a, it's a Far Eastern power. So of course, it looks at the world through a different lens, um, from, certainly from us in, 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 in Europe. Um, and I, I think there's plenty of evidence of the, the linkage between Russian actions in Europe, Russian actions in the Middle East. I think the, 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 the efforts at dividing and ruling, um, dividing the international organizations, which I think Russia sees as its, its opposition, NATO particularly, European Union to a certain extent. I think what we see with the, the cozying up of, of President Putin and President Erdogan, on the face of it, uh, two leaders with very different views about, for example, Assad. Uh, two countries which came to blows last year with the shooting down of, an, of a Russian jet by, by Turks. Uh, and yet, there is Putin getting very close to, to Erdogan, and I'm sure that's all about dividing, dividing and ruling the NATO alliance. Uh, because in division uh, is success, in unity uh, is failure. And that comes back to the, 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 the point about solidarity, which we, which we heard earlier from General Breedlove. <clears throat> Coming back to, to Poland, uh, I'm going to ask you the crucial question. We're all mindful in Poland of, of 1939, of waiting for, for an Allied move, which never came. You dwell in your book and elsewhere on the vagaries of the ambassadorial structure in NATO, the ambassadors 
uh, taking time to take a decision. How long would Poland have if its borders were encroached upon uh, until Article 5 were triggered, providing legalities worked in terms of the, the triggering event as such? Well, of course, I don't know the answer to that because I'm not a, I'm not a, I haven't got a crystal ball. But what I would say to that is that I, um, I, I'm totally confident that the alliance will lives and stands by Article Five. Um, and but would it, would it take a week? Would it take two weeks? Um, again, I, I'm not going to be drawn on that because I don't know. But I, what I can tell you is that my observations from NATO, and I have been. I've been critical of, of NATO a lack of agility of decision making in, in, in the book. But let me take you back to Libya in 2011 when it took 13 days flash to bang from the United Nations Security Council resolution 1973 calling on NATO to take the lead in the no-fly zone and maritime exclusion zone. Um, and I watched the North Atlantic Council go through a pretty bruising process of decision making and actually having and, and there was a lot of antagonism at one stage, real differences between nations, but in a very statesmanlike manner, through discussion, through diplomacy, uh, I'm sure there was a bit of backdoor diplomacy as well, actually NATO formed a consensus, and the consensus stayed rock solid. So I'm, I, I believe that the consensus would stay rock solid over Article 5. But we have to take note of, for example, the Financial Times poll, opinion polls last year, which went to Germany, to France, to the UK, and to other countries, and took a poll on the levels of support for Article 5. And they were pretty, it made for pretty depressing reading. But I think when push come, comes to shove, the Alliance will stand behind a NATO member if attacked. Um, but don't forget as well that Article 5 not only calls on all members to react if a NATO member of attack is attacked, but lays on individual members a, a, an individual responsibility to come to the, NATO, uh, the aid of a NATO member if attacked, um, even until Article 5 has been declared. I guess the main point is we need to avoid that eventuality, and we need to be in a position. I mean, if Article 5 is ever declared, it means that deterrence has failed and that the alliance has failed. The point of deterrence is to avoid that eventuality, and so I come back to effective defense and effect and real capabilities that send an unquestioning signal to any potential adversary that the risks of getting involved with NATO are simply too high, so back off. Which brings us neatly to preparations that Poland should be embarking upon. In the, in the summer, we jointly published a paper for the Atlantic Council about uh, preparedness uh, in, in the region and, and in Poland specifically. And I'd be wrong if I were to claim that Polish procurement and planning has accelerated since that point. If anything, it's gone, it's gone backward. Uh, there are a number of programs that uh, are being contemplated. Some are being discussed uh, today and over the next, uh, next few days. Uh, missile defense will take time. Submarines will take time. Uh, if you were sitting in the Kremlin or if you were sitting in the a command bunker um, in, in, in the Western military region, what moves by Poland over the next three, six, 18 months would, would, would make you take extra stock, take, uh, be, be more concerned about any rash moves and would lead you at the limit to uh, object to instructions, to dispute instructions from, from, from the Kremlin? Okay, well, I would almost extrapolate from the pan-NATO level down to an individual nation, nation level, such, and, and, and obviously Poland is, 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 is the point here. Number one, it is the requirement and the ability to counter the insidious effects of hybrid asymmetric warfare, call it what you like, the sort of very slick professional operation that we saw roll out in Crimea in 2014. So that's all about um, that's all about countering the manipulation of minorities through clever, clever, entertaining, sophisticated Kremlin TV and other information warfare. So I would put information operations, information warfare up there as a, as a, as a capability that is required in the 21st century. Part of that as well, I would highlight the importance of cyber and offensive cyber because we've got to be clever in this area and uh, NATO has been very effective at defensive cyber uh, 
but the, there is a challenge on offensive cyber because of the, the because of national national security considerations. So I would I would highlight the importance of, of, of cyber. And just to come in on that, I mean, both are, are actually extremely cheap for a country like Poland to implement. Uh, it's it's much cheaper to employ 500 Russian speakers to uh, to hit the the Russian social media say. Uh, than to, uh, to contract for submarines from some of the countries we've been hearing from this morning. But go on, please. Well, I would compliment that, that, that the, 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 the new age warfare requirement by, by, some con by, by conventional capability. Uh, and the conventional piece is, is really by land, sea and air being able to demonstrate a regeneration of the capabilities for high-end warfare. Because that's something, as we heard earlier, that's something that I think that, 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 that's been lost. Uh, we've got to regenerate that, that ability, that knowledge, that understanding uh, in, in, in the land warfare context, the ability to, to maneuver significant formations uh, in a way which we haven't done uh, for, for, uh, for, for a decade plus, frankly. And I think that's the, those are the areas that I would, I would be looking at. And of course, part of that, in equipment terms, there will be, a, 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 no doubt, a particular shopping list. Um, but I think it's capitalizing on the, the advantages that we as an alliance in technical and technological terms can bring to the party, whether it's long range strike, whether it's ballistic missile defense, it's, 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 but it's, 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 it's enhancing, it's building on, on the successes that we've got. And I'm sure that's as applicable in the Polish cases as, uh, as elsewhere. But I would also add that it's the sinews of war that are so important in the conventional sense. It's one thing to have, to have land capability, air capability, or maritime capability, but it's a completely other thing to have the, the depth and the resilience to be able to put up and cope with the long term, with, with, the, with the impact of the clash of arms. So it's about readiness, and that means training. It means the right people, properly trained, properly selected. It means enough of them. It means um, equipment, enough of it. It means sustainability, and I think I'd highlight the issue of sustainability because <laughs> Because it was, uh, you know, of course, um, as, uh, as, as, uh, as, as, as has often been said, it's not, you know, professionals talk tactics, but professionals talk, um, amateurs talk tactics, but it's professionals who talk uh, logistics. So I would highlight the importance of the sinews of war. Well, certainly in terms of the general awareness of, of risk and of the potential to, to build in-depth logistic support and other kinds of support <coughs> which you're alluding to, Poland is... Uh, arguably uh, ahead of countries to the west, though perhaps Sweden and other places in Scandinavia uh, are also quite quite attuned to to the risk uh, from the from the east that we're that we're talking about. Um, as a final block of, uh, of uh, final topic, uh, you're aware, of course, that Poland is contemplating uh, 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 territorial defence. And indeed, some, some decisions were, were taken very recently as to the shape of, of the territorial defense force. There's talk of 17 or, or more brigades, of 40 or, or more thousand people, uh, drawn on the, we hear, 400,000 in the country who uh, will go through some form of military training, amateur training, or, or weekend dressing up in uniforms, uh, and are, are the pool of, of people who can be drawn on for these forces. What is your recommendation? <clears throat> what is your recommendation as to what these forces should be? Should they be mixed, uh, heavy, light, uh, mobile infantry able to fight with existing frontline mobile and, and armored forces, uh, with all that implies in terms of cost and training, uh, but implications for deterrence as well? Or should they be light, uh, stay behind, forest orientated guerrilla type uh, uh, people again of the kind that you extol in the in the Baltics uh, in in your book and elsewhere well it would be it'd be rather impertinent of me to make recommendations to the Polish Ministry of Defense but what I no, from wait, the point, sorry, you, you, you're entitled to, to uh, okay well let me just try to look at it from from the Russian okay. perspective what okay. the Russian what would worry me what would worry about? me if I was a Russian decision maker is Polish armed forces that have got the resilience and the capability to really match me and stop me dead in my tracks from a conventional perspective. And so therefore, that requires going back to the resilience of the, and the depth and the right people piece uh, as well. But I would also be 
pretty concerned uh, about the the territorial defence. And as you say in the in in the book, I draw on the example of the Forest Brothers from uh, of the Bal famous from the, the Baltic states who stayed behind in the forest and continued the fight against the Soviet Union well into the 1950s. Indeed, the last of the Forest Brothers, I think, only came out of the forest in about, in, in, in about 1994. Um, so that sort of stay behind, un undercover guerrilla activity is all, has, again, I think you need to see that as part of, as complementary to the conventional capability. Uh, and, and, and that would be a concern if I was thinking about, about taking on Poland. At the end of the day, um, yes, the alliance is, 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 is the foundation of no doubt of Polish defense as it is of the, of the defense of every other NATO member. But nevertheless, charity begins at home and territorial defense is fundamental to defense of the, of the homeland uh, and that needs to be attended to as well. And I, susp and I would suggest that the sort of measures that you, you outline would fit very neatly alongside complementing a, a conventional capability. But I would also add that it's, it, it needs time, it needs training, it needs resources, and it's not something, and it needs a cultural, the right cultural approach, uh, which sits easily within the society that you're, you're talking about. Well, again, in terms of some of these, some of these aspects, uh, the, the, the cultural fit, the historical fit with Poland is better than with, uh, with, with other countries, and we're more similar, uh, we're, we're similar to uh, the Baltics in that, in that, in that respect. I guess that, that wraps it up for now. Is there a question from the, from the hall? There is a, a raised, is that, uh, yes, please. Uh, Adam Sova, uh, this time I will give some background. I am, I am a retired uh, army general. I had a chance to serve at the NATO headquarters as well and also as a deputy chief executive of the European Defense Agency. I give this only to say that I have some background to understand the military business. And uh, when I hear about assurances, deterrence, this is what I understand. Uh, when I uh, hear about war with Russia, I stop understanding this military business. I have not read uh, this book, but for me, uh, with Russia, what we could have, we could have incidents, we could have some local frictions or below the radar uh, actions, but otherwise, I don't see war with Russia, but just annihilation of the humanity. So as we know, uh, NATO spends in two or three weeks the money that, that it is Russian budget. So uh, there is no parity on conventional uh, weapons. And uh, this is for sure that uh, when Russia uh, sees the danger above some level, we will go for full-scale uh, nuclear war. So then, what, what is this war about? Because I don't see any protective measures. I don't see if General Bridlav is here, but could you just elaborate on it, how war with Russia could uh, look like? Thank you. Well, what, I, what I've written about in this book is a, is a fictional scenario of, which describes how, as a result of a number of, of a result of cumulative disarmament over two decades, particularly in Europe, uh, as a result of um, uh, increased nationalism, as a result of the, the change dynamic which we've seen in Russia, certainly since uh, the Crimea uh, invasion in 2014, the fact that, in the words of Ambassador Sandy Vashba, Russia has moved, moved from being uh, we were looking to establish a strategic partnership with Russia and NATO. De facto, after Crimea, Russia has become a strategic adversary. And the nightmare for me is that somehow we sleepwalk into the unthinkable, as you say, war with Russia. Uh, and because that is, that is existential. That is an existential threat to our existence because of the extent to which Russia integrates nuclear weapons into every aspect of their defense doctrine. 
Yes, of course, you're right that in overall terms, numerical terms, defense spending terms, NATO is overwhelmingly stronger than Russia. Three and a half million men and women under arms, uh, as opposed to whatever the Russian armed forces, land forces, around about 900, and, uh, just, just shy of a million, 930,000 or there or thereabouts. But nevertheless, the fact remains that Russia can concentrate strength where NATO has no strength, particularly, for example, in the eastern territories of NATO and particularly in the Baltic states. So the book is a wake-up call to alert, to alarm, to get people thinking, to make people realize um, that for all the, all the measures taken at Wales, yes, and at Warsaw, uh, there's a still a very long way to go before NATO is in a position to provide and offer a genuine deterrent capability which raises the bar of risk so high that the thought of war in Europe becomes unthinkable. I say war in Europe, let's not forget there is an existing war in Europe in eastern Ukraine, but the thought of an attack by Russia on the Baltic states becomes absolutely unthinkable. Uh, and the aim, as much as anything, is to ensure that the sort of nightmare scenario which I outlined in this book stays very firmly in the pages of fiction. I think there, there couldn't be a better conclusion than that last phrase. We're talking about deterrence and to avoid the unthinkable. Thank you very much.